So now on the screen, I am so excited to welcome two incredible friends of mine. So I'm going to start with Amanda Prochaska. She is the founder and chief wonder officer. Now she's built her career over the last 19 years, focusing on implementing innovative solutions for procurement organizations. And she has a passion for leading organizations through large scale transformation. In her former role at MGM, she was responsible for implementing and sustaining new best-in-class sourcing programs and the leading the source to pay transformation. Now she's currently the chief wonder officer at Wonder Services, which is a radically different consulting from the normal procurement organizations. So you want her folks to come in and help you. I have met a bunch of people that work there and she is absolutely incredible and her passion shows and she's been giving back to the procurement community and she has been someone that you really want to have um, in your Rolodex or your contacts. And then I'm, I'm assuming you all know Edmund Sogoran. He is brilliant and he's funny, but he's also the chief strategy officer and founder of Orchestro. He is a proud procurement and nerd obsessed with the power of recommendations to fix broken processes and supply chains. Now, former prior to, for, to founding Orchestro, Edmund worked as a consultant focused on data-driven supplier negotiations for large healthcare providers, contract manufacturers, and multi-campus retail brands. Edmund is widely recognized as a thought leader, and you're going to know why he is after you hear him talk today. He has been, he has led head leadership teams at 3M, BASF, General Motors, Volkswagen, PwC, Kearney, EY, Accenture. It goes on and on and on. And he is also, um, he's been featured by Forbes, Shared Services and Outsourcing Network, and ProcureTech. So I am so welcome. I'm so excited to welcome the two of you, two of my favorite people to join us today for today's webinar. And I want to start off by also thanking Orchestro because it's been an incredible company to get to know. And I had the opportunity to be at their last two optimal events. And wow, they are literally changing the world of procurement. So Edmund, your vision, your strategy has done wonders for our industry. And I love that you're a procurement nerd because you're always turning us on to really cool facts. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you too. And folks, I want you right now to open up your Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. That is where you submit questions, please. If you put them in chat, we might lose them. And then if we don't get to your questions, I will make sure that we send them to Edmund and Amanda to follow up with you after today's webinar is complete. Now, you are going to get a copy of the recording tomorrow about noon EST, uh, Eastern Standard Time. You will get both the slides and the talk track and the visuals. And so we will be sending all of that to you. So I know, uh, Probably 13 people are going to ask. So yes, you will get it. And I'll repeat that later on today. And so Edmund and Amanda, take it away. Thanks so much, Don. <clears throat> it's, it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to uh, have an opportunity to talk with the SIG community and, of course, to talk with uh, my good friend, Amanda. Before we get into the discussion, uh, we prepared a few slides really just to prime uh, the discussion today and, and to bring um, some structure and some data to it. So the title of this webinar is, Is Procurement Ready for the Recession? And before we get into discussing that, I think it's really important to define what is a recession. Now, this written here is the dictionary definition that will come up as the top Google search result if you type in this question. It is the uh, widely recognized definitive um, answer to the question, what is a recession? A period of temporary economic decline during which trade and industrial activity are reduced, generally identified by a fall in GDP in two successive quarters. Now, I want to call out three things about this definition. One, it's the dictionary definition, but it's not necessarily the official definition. And we'll actually look at that a little bit later on. Second, GDP uh, is often uh, related to a specific nation. And so when we talk about a global recession versus a US recession, that actually can change the definition, what it means and how it's measured. And also different countries may measure or use different indicators to report GDP. And third is that um, if you think about what when we 
read the news and talk about, hey, are we in a recession now? Are we going there? We actually don't know if we're in a recession until after the second of those successive quarters has ended. And so a declaration of a recession is nearly always a backwards looking, uh, a backwards looking statement. Destiny, could you advance the next slide, please? So are we currently in a recession? <clears throat> well, different people will give you different answers, but if we use the definition that we just looked at, as of January 2023, two weeks ago, the technical answer would be no. We had GDP growth in the United States of 2.9% and the previous quarter by 3.2% according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Uh, Destiny, uh, next slide, please. So why do economists think a recession is coming or not? Uh, if you look at the news, there is you know, a daily headline or a daily batch of headlines drawing on different, <clears throat> excuse me, indicators to look at recessionary headwinds and especially how recession uh, fears are playing out in the business decisions in the companies that we work at or support in different areas of the economy. I will tell you that sitting in San Francisco uh, amidst a huge round of layoffs from technology companies, this is a topic that's on everyone's lips uh, on a daily basis. Uh, next slide, please. So a survey recently found that 69% of Americans are worried about a possible recession by the end of 2023. And <clears throat> while some believe that we will have a so-called soft landing as the Federal Reserve uh, raises interest rates, uh, that has not been the history. If you look at previous recessions, specifically in the 1980s and early 1990s, when the Fed raises interest rates, often in response to inflation, a recession is uh, often what follows. Whether it happens immediately, whether it's short or long, depends on a whole host of factors. Next slide, please. And so there are a ton of economic indicators that you could look at in trying to decipher whether we are currently in a recession or whether a recession is looming. You could look at a combination of uh, inflation, mortgage rates, home prices, job openings. And one of the things that's been really interesting is that while a lot of people are feeling economic anxiety and a lot of businesses are beginning to focus on cutting costs, unemployment is at a historic low. And so companies are still very focused on attracting and retaining top talent, often through uh, economic incentives or increased wages. And so wages, despite the fact that the economy uh, potentially is going through some tough times or will soon, seem to continue going up in many sectors. Next slide, please. And you hear Janet Yellen. This, by the way, is not a picture of Janet Yellen. It was just um, the picture that was, was on uh, the, the news page, um, who says, you don't have a recession when US unemployment is at a 53-year low. And so this is one of the reasons that economists have trouble agreeing if we are in a recession now or soon will be one. And it's one of the reasons why there is so much discussion among C-suite leadership teams, executive leadership teams, and procurement organizations about the correct way to navigate and position their own activities and their own strategic roadmaps, whether it goes down to hiring, what the organization should look like, investments in change management, investments in technology, how they should relate to their suppliers, uh, what attitude or approach they should take during supplier negotiations, discussions, contract renewals, and so on. And as a result, this topic has gotten a lot of airtime inside of especially enterprise procurement organizations, but actually uh, procurement organizations in companies of all sizes. And so 
I am going to uh, close this presentation. Uh, go, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. This is the last of the presentation, and then we'll get into it uh, with a uh, discussion with Amanda. And uh, hopefully all of you participate if you have questions or if there's something that uh, from, from some of the data that we've shared that's sparked interest or comment, uh, please put it in the chat. Um, but I, I wanna end on this, which is why, why is predicting a recession challenging? At least in the United States, the official recession scorekeeper is a committee inside of the National Bureau of Economic Research. And it uses a quite vague definition for what a recession is. It's spread across a host of economic indicators. And I'm gonna just read the last part of this paragraph out loud because I think it's telling. Notably, there are no fixed rules or thresholds that trigger a determination of a decline. And so with that, uh, Destiny, I actually believe we have a, uh, a quick poll for the audience. We're just going to ask everyone, do you think we are in a recession or will soon be in one? And uh, so you see it on your screen. You can, can vote right now. And then with that, I'd love to uh, just get Amanda and I up and we can take the conversation from here. So um, Amanda, I know we're going to get the poll results soon. But how are mm -hmm. you feeling? What are you seeing at Wonder Services or in the, the partner of Wonder Services who are working through some of the procurement road mapping challenges? And just what is a recession and do you think we're in one? So uh, first of all, awesome slides and great introduction to the topic, Evan. So as usual, you covered it uh, quite well. So I'll, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, my, my formal study was in international political economics. And so one thing that I learned in that study was that economics is all about human behavior and incentives. So what was notable about your stats there was that, well, look, we have a split, we have a split crew right here, the results. I don't know if everyone can see that, but 35% yes, 37% no, and then about the same of not sure. <laughs> that is a remarkable split for, <laughs> it is. for a group of like, this is a thing that really smart people disagree about, and I think yeah. have good good reason to, to mm -hmm. reach opposite conclusion. Yeah. yeah. The interesting thing is about how people are reacting to all the news, right? So whether we're in a recession or we're not in a recession, if you feel like you're in a recession, you're going to have different behaviors and different incentives that are driving those behaviors. So that that's, to me, one of the, the key indicators. You know, 69 percent of Americans believe we're going to be in a recession by the end of the year. That's going to change the way people behave. But one one other thing that I wanted to mention here was that I was watching the news the other day because this is all over right now, at least in the United States for those that are here. And one of the best explanations I heard was this concept of a rolling recession, which is something that I've never really studied before. I think it's somewhat of a new concept where certain industries, certain sectors within the economy are going to perhaps be in recession, but the overall economy is not. So we're seeing that like it may be in the tech sector right now with all the layoffs and what's going on or in the home market. Um, I was telling pre-show we were talking about, I, I just bought an RV this morning, RV prices are down. They're, they're taking a little bit of a hit in, in that industry. So, but other industries are doing very well. Pharma is doing, I think, fairly well um, with everything that's going on. So it's kind of this interesting aspect of what's going on in the overall economy right now, where you can perhaps have a recessionary feeling or a true recession in a sector of the economy, but you still overall are performing to meet your original uh, definition of what uh, a recession might or not might not be so that I thought that was a super interesting because that's what I'm feeling I feel like certain parts of the economy are maybe suffering where others are are staying very strong that's that's super interesting Amanda and and I think uh just to resonate on something you said it's all about how we respond to our perception of an eco of the economic activity at scale, mm -hmm. not just as individuals, but as a group. I think, you know, I go back to that famous quote from FDR, 
the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And that was about the um, that was about the Great Depression. You know, that was really about how economic activity creates, uh, you know, emotional, but also like rational responses based on how we interpret and perceive the facts of a situation. Mm -hmm. And so that's actually a great segue for, you know, our next uh, question, which is, how is procurement that sees a recession looming? You know, are you, they seeing it as a challenge, opportunity, or are people hedging their bets? So we have another poll up here um, where you can vote. Are, you, are, are people seeing this recession fear as a challenge, opportunity, or I'm not sure? So as, as we're, we're looking at that, I wonder just from your standpoint, if, if you'd be open to, to comment on that from, from your perspective, mm -hmm. what are you seeing procurement teams do in response to a uh, real or perceived rolling recession? So there's a couple of things and, and going back to there are no rules, right? The, the definition that you, you ended with, I think we learned that over the last several years within procurement too. Like there's there's just mm -hmm. so many things that we learned and what, what we pre previously perceived may not be reality. Here's here's what I would say. Ah, opportunity. I love the optimism wow. in this group. Opportunity just <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Okay. So um, so one thing that I was thinking about is whoever can predict accurately what the markets are going to do, let's just say in a commodity or any space that they're buying effectively, will win the game, mm. right? So, so to me, that's all about, okay, are we still talking about data? Or are we talking about insights? Are we truly mm. understanding the ins and outs of our supply chains, the, the micro supply chains of whatever you're buying? and the economic factors that are surrounding that. So for instance, if we are in one of those rolling recessions in one of your areas of spend, mm. how well do you know that and how well are you reacting to it? And so I'll give you an, a for instance, um, last mm. uh, last December we had, I, one of, I was talking to a CPO and he, his, his area of spend, there's a large concentration in one particular commodity, okay? Mm. And so well in advance of the holiday season, in fact, maybe six to eight months before mm. that, he was able to predict that there was likely going to be a shortage of this commodity heading into the manufacturing season that produces for mm. the holiday season, okay? He won in that instance because his prediction was correct. They bought more inventory in advance to secure their positions. Mm. And they took over market share during the holidays because they had supply where their competitors didn't. Mm. So that's what I'm saying. Like procurement <laughs> has the total, the, the great opportunity right now to really focus on not the spend that I've had with this supplier over the last mm. 24 months, but what's the activity that I can predict in the marketplace to mm. secure the, a better price, a better value, better supply. That's really where we need to go. That's, that's super interesting. And I think that, you know, as we think about procurement operations and, you know, we're in dialogue with uh, a lot of people that work in center of excellence uh, activities mm -hmm. in terms of really trying to provide real-time recommendations as much as possible and not just recommendations to their procurement organization, but to the line of business in terms of if there are key third parties that are involved in a business activity. And I think, you know, buying ahead of a price increase or, you know, making sure that you're prepared for changing market conditions is a great uh, example of, of one of the ways that just being able to see around corners a little bit can be uh, tremendously valuable. But one thing that's been really interesting to see is just the way that being more forward looking in understanding internal spend can not yep. only 
um, help deal with suppliers, but can also help deal with stakeholders. And I'll, I'll give you an example. If uh, you know you have a group of stakeholders in different business units that buy similar or the same thing at the same time, even if that's a service, being able to put that together to bring that uh, to market, even if it's with an existing supplier, can dramatically change the pricing and in some cases, the service levels that mm -hmm. these stakeholders are able to access. And so it's nice to be able, and, and we've seen this, the power of that real-time recommendation or that prediction to be able to go to a stakeholder and say, hey, I actually got you, not only did I get you a better deal, but I get you a better quality of service from your preferred from your preferred provider because we were able to combine it with some 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 other similar things that that other people in different parts of the business uh, wanted, and yeah. and and you know I think uh, as volatility ticks up, the value of procurement getting involved earlier just continues to increase. There is a study that Spend Matters did in around. I believe 2015, that said the incremental value of procurement getting involved before the stakeholder uh, had uh, communicated with a supplier. Uh, it was something, <laughs> it, was a, it was a significant percentage uh, increase. And I, I always love that because procurement, I think, working in procurement, it's always uh, the time where you get involved oftentimes has an effect on the, the impact uh, that one can have. And, and as mm -hmm. procurement sees opportunity in these recessionary periods, I think that's a great case to make to our stakeholders and to the C-suite of, hey, getting us involved earlier has a real business impact, regardless of what ends up happening with, with the specific cycle. Yep, absolutely. And so I want to just uh, turn to, in general, as this is kind of the way that we're beginning 2023, Amanda, what just general trends are you seeing um, in your conversations with procurement professionals or like themes that might be impacted by, uh, you know, uh, the way people are rethinking the operating model around not just recessionary fears, but uh, in general kind of procurement's opportunity, as you saw, we, I think 72% of our respondents on this poll said that they see opportunity increasing uh, mm -hmm. in, in response to the macroeconomic environment. Yeah, I think it's a it's a huge opportunity for procurement to really shine in these types of uh, environments. The one thing, though, that I will say a little bit on more of the con side of what I'm seeing as a trend right mm -hmm. now is that you know, after we had COVID, then we had all these supply issues, the supply issues are continuing. And I'm mm -hmm. hearing a lot of procurement people feeling super overwhelmed, and or burnt out, which, which mm -hmm. makes me a little bit fearful, because we have such a huge opportunity in front of us with this vial, mm -hmm. the, like all of all of this rolling recession that's going on, and all of the mm -hmm. opportunity for us to be predictive and agile. Mm -hmm. Um, I just hope that we can figure out ways to take the mundane off of the plate, right? Yeah. So we can focus on those deeper conversations. I do see a trend, like a couple of years ago, there was a trend organizationally to go very um, generic in our category mm. management. So you could have a category manager rotating through different categories mm. in more of an agile kind of pod approach. I'm seeing mm. a pull back from that a little bit and going mm. deeper into categories because as we have all of these variables going on in the supply chain and in, in the economy, you need people that have a little bit more deeper expertise so you can be predictive, right? They know the questions to ask and, and build those relationships with the supplier. So I am mm. seeing a little bit of a swing back. Um, and I'm also seeing the need, the continual need for automation through technology, but effective technology, right? The technology that's truly going to have the ROIs that we're expecting and truly have the impact, the positive impact on the work that procurement does day in and day out. So those are a couple of things. We still, we still need to adopt that technology. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of technology out there, maybe not a lot of usage of it. Um, mm. which is something that I'm super passionate yep. about, but 
Um, so I think, I think there's a lot going on in procurement right now. In a nutshell, I think we have people that are overwhelmed, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot yep. being asked of us right now. And as leaders of, uh, in your organizations and in the profession, because you're spending the time here today, we need to figure out solutions, technology solutions and others to make sure that we, we can do the right things at the right time and, and have our people still intact at the end of the day. And Amanda, I love what you said to, to take the mundane out of it. And mm -hmm. given, um, you know, your storied career at MGM and, and um, just all of the great work you've done in the procurement community, I, I just, I can't resist the urge to ask, could you give our audience just one, uh, one tactic or tip to keep a, a procurement team engaged and motivated as uh, people might be economically anxious or otherwise overworked or overwhelmed? Okay, so this is super easy and it doesn't take a lot of money to do. But as leaders, if you have people on your team simply saying, what can we do better? And then go mm -hmm. and do it, right? It, it's such a simple mm -hmm. thing. But often what, when, you, when you talk to the team members that are doing the work day in and day out, they have 101 mm -hmm. ways to improve the day-to-day. Mm. but often they don't feel like they're listened to, mm. right? So even if you take two of that 101 on their list and fix it, it goes a long way. Mm. And that could be, I don't know, like it could be putting a, a system like Orchestro in to help them uh, do something more effectively, or it could be a process improvement, who mm. knows, but um, that little act can make such a difference in the, in the team's overall ability to execute, but then also, um, I don't know, their want to stay in the job and, and to be happy mm. day in and day out. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a really profound uh, observation, especially with the, the put in orchestra. Uh, I'm joking, but <laughs> um, I, I, no, I, I, all joking aside, I think it really is great procurement people want to make an impact at the end of the day they want to see their work show up in the kpis and numbers that that matter not just to the team but to the other stakeholders uh in the business and if if they if they have a better mousetrap or they find a better route to get to the same thing i think it's uh incumbent upon us as leaders regardless of 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 what it is and assuming it doesn't doesn't uh you know uh cost a mint to, right. <laughs> to at least hear the idea um, and uh, and 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 to listen. So I I think it it can't be overstated the effect that fear of a recession will have on team morale and on the way that people think about their own incentives. Um, you know to uh, strive for excellence, put in extra hours, and procurement as as a as a profession uh, is often seen, or at least historically has been, as counter cyclical, which means it makes more of an impact to a business when the economy ain't doing great. Right. And, you know, I think one of the challenges, though, that a lot of procurement teams have is that in certain types of organizations, and it really does depend. Um, mm -hmm. how big the organization is and uh, what the priorities in the next 18 months are. If you get um, a group, you know, coming in uh, or the executive team gets together and says, hey, we have to make some cuts. Where are we going to make the cuts? Uh, GNA as a category, which procurement often falls within, yep. sometimes can be on that list. And so, there is this really interesting dynamic where procurement, you know, an hour of procurement time during a recessionary period might be one of the most valuable hours in the business. If you just look at the ROI of that hour of time spent mm -hmm. doing, um, you know, supply management, cost reduction, value creation, what have you. Um, at the same time, management's thinking, where can I you know, make, make cuts or where can I trim? And so I wanted, we have another poll and destiny, maybe you can, can put this up. The question is, will procurement teams cut or expand headcount during a recession? And by the way, maybe it's some will and some won't. 
Um, but I, I'd be curious just to see what our audience here on this webinar has, has to say. So, and then while we're waiting for the responses, I do have some thoughts in this area. I was, I was talking to a CPO a couple of months ago and I thought it was fascinating because we were talking about key metrics, key performance mm -hmm. indicators, whatever you want to say of how their, his team was being measured. And he said he went away from savings. Mm -hmm. um, and he went to return on investment for each headcount in procurement. Yeah. Um, which I think is very smart, especially mm -hmm. in these times where you could go to your CFO and say, it's not really a very, there, mm. there you go. Yeah. 71% fewer people, more roles. Doing more with less, I, I think is what that one calls for, right? That's about out right um but so as as we're go going through this time period being able to walk up to the C cfo and say we're really not a cost center here's the return on investment mm -hmm. for each head that i have on my team and when you yep. take one head out you can expect that return to go down so i i i i think it's really smart positioning to go that way if you're leading an organization to have that opportunity to uh, change the way you're looking at savings numbers to a return on investment number for your team. That, I think uh, that that's, oh, hey, Don. Hey, Don. <laughs> <laughs> I popped in because we, we we have a few questions that I'd like to interject with a couple of these because they're very interesting. Oh, and perfect. So the first one says the volume of containers from China to the US has dramatically dropped in to, compared to the pre-COVID levels and during COVID, certainly an indicator of demand down. Is that a leading indicator for recession in your opinion? Uh, do you wanna take that one or do you want me to? I, I can take it. My initial thought is it is a indicator. I don't know if it's a leading indicator or not. Um, what I would typically look at is consumer spending down, is manufacturing down, those are two that I would look at maybe first and maybe some inflationary numbers. Demand, uh, the container ships from China, I mean, if you look at buying behavior during COVID, we were, we were buying more online. Obviously, we weren't going out to stores. And um, the mo more of those items that we were buying online could be coming from China versus being local, local shops that we might go into day in, day out. So there's a lot of factors that go into those container ships being down, but we still see consumer spending actually staying fair, like it's still up, right? Um, and uh, however, debt's up too. So that's the unfortunate side of that equation, but that's what I would look at first maybe versus the container ships. I don't know, Edmund, if you have another opinion on that. Yeah, I, Amanda, I, I would agree with everything that you said and, and would only add to that, you know, as we look at the role that China is playing in the global geopolitical stage and uh, the, you know, effects of some of the tariffs that uh, kicked in a few years ago, I mean, these take a long time to show up in these economic indicators. And so, while the U.S. and China are key trading partners, and, and that's not going to change, I think if you look at aggregate increases and decreases, there, you're going to see a trend as people have moved manufacturing or moved some of their uh, trading that's partnerships correct. out of the People's Republic of China. Um, that's yeah. a trend that we're seeing um, in a number of sectors of the economy, whether it's related to national security like semiconductors or not. Mm -hmm. um, there are just risk factors associated with importing certain types of goods and materials. And so that would just be something, uh, grain of salt or an asterisk yeah. on using the, the, the freight and, and the shipping indexes to kind of key in on, on a macro economic indicator. Yeah. Great yeah, point. I, great ad. Good. So then somebody else said, I read a mini blog this morning that generalized major differences between small and large procurement teams and their capability to react to external environmental factors. One point was the ability to understand the breadth of suppliers. However, I felt that even a smaller mid-market procurement team could still obtain the information needed to make changes or at least find alternative sources of supply. 
do you agree? And so do you think smaller mid-sized procurement teams are going to react to a recession as efficiently or effectively as a large procurement team? Oh, Edmund, take that one first. I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's here's what I would say. And and it's just a, a little anecdote that hopefully is is um, useful uh, kind of broadly across the audience. So I was having a conversation with uh, a guy named Jeffrey Immelt, who was the CEO of General Electric and uh, now sits on Orchestra's board. And I asked him, I said, when you were looking at the health of procurement in companies that were business units of GE, what was the indicator KPI that you looked at the most? And he said, I would always ask, uh, the business leader, the GM, if they had dual sourcing for a meaningful percentage of the bill of materials in the products that, that were key to our profitability and our profit margin. And I thought that that was super interesting because now GEs it would be on the large side in terms of large versus small procurement teams for sure. But I think that whether or not you are uh, currently doing business with them. If you are a manufacturer, you the reason that for at least some of the meaningful volume, dual sourcing is so important and having the, at least the leverage of alternate suppliers is that otherwise you completely lose pricing power as the supplier realizes that they have leverage, honestly, regardless of the macro economy, to dictate the terms of the business relationship. And we see this play out time and time again in uh, programs around supplier management, around uh, cost management, around value creation, um, really around even strategic initiatives um, for things like diversity and sustainability. If procurement is not able to identify alternative avenues of supply that are preferred to the business for whatever reason, then I think the value proposition that even a small procurement team can offer uh, becomes limited as well. And I guess the final thing I'll note is that, um, you know, we've worked with teams that are as small as one or two procurement professionals that manage over a billion dollars of spend themselves. And they're not making impact across all of the managed spend. But you would be surprised, given uh, the data that's out there, the ability to leverage automation, how much a small procurement team can really deliver. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. This is a tough question for me. The, my, my only addition, I think, Edmund, to, to your comments was that I could see smaller procurement teams maybe not being as specialized or having getting pulled in many different directions at once just because it's a smaller team so you have to cover more space which might make it difficult in certain instances to effectively be focused in the areas that you need to be focused in to react appropriately in this rolling recession atmosphere so that's the only thing but if you have the tools if you have the insights um and you have the focus i think a large organization would perform just as effectively as a small one, et cetera. I think so too. So yeah. um, another question, Amanda, and this is yeah. um, to you. It says, would you advocate a periodic department-wide Kazon type event to outline the waste and possible solutions for the record and then look for two or three to work on? Oh, yes, absolutely. So we used to do this as a team. We actually would do it more than once a year where we would um, basically get the team members in a room and we would start whiteboarding. And I, I like to, to talk about it in like a start, stop, continue kind of a thing first to say, okay, what, what should we absolutely continue doing? What should we stop? But, um, and what should we just, we should start new. Um, but in that continuing, that's where you need to dive in to say, what can we improve? So we, we used to come up with a list of things that we wanted to work on in each of those sessions. So um, now the hardest part, what I would say to everyone in my experience, no matter if I was leading a team or with my clients, it is super, super easy to come up with ideas, mm -hmm. right? The hard part is executing them and executing them well. <laughs> so, 
So that's that's the change that I would say is that yes, we can come up with ideas, but do you have the skill sets on your team to actually deploy effectively? Um, would be the other question. Good. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. Yako, Yako Vanderland, you put a question in, and I'm not quite sure of what it means. So I'm going to say it. So maybe it's just me that's missing the point of it. And it says, how do you see the role of a supplier in relation to a spend management platform change in or as we approach a recession? So the role of supplier um, in relation to a spend yep. management platform. Uh, maybe their adoption of it. I, I could see it going that way. So if you're rolling out a, a spend management platform and um, let's just say we're heading into a recession for all intents and purposes um, to answer the question, will a supplier react differently to that adoption of it? Um, but Edmund, you probably might see this in your, your system tool, the, the tool itself and the willingness to adapt. But what I've seen so far with just supplier enablement that's going on right now with these large technical implementations, you do have to have a change management strategy to make sure that they're on board, they understand why, you can answer their questions, they can understand alternatives. Also giving them a choice always helps, like what here are the three paths that you can go through and all three paths are approved by us. Um, so they, but I'm not seeing an actual impact in their willingness to adapt, right? So if you have those strategies, I'm, I'm seeing very high success rates in getting that done. Um, so right now, knock on wood, I have not seen any like change in behavior within the supply base as we're in these times that we're in right now. I mean, I don't know if you have anything else to add, Edmund, on that. Yeah, you know, I think the the topic of supplier adoption is always going to be relevant to any type of digital procurement project, really, regardless of of what it is. Um, <clears throat> I actually want to take a slightly different answer, just based on what what we've seen is that. The answer depends on the category. So for direct materials and actually for logistics and shipping and freight specifically, suppliers, if the market is short, have a lot more power. And so in some cases they will um, have the ability to say, hey, here's how I wanna do business. And if you don't wanna do business with me, there's a long line out my door. And if they perceive that there is a challenge or barrier uh, to a solution, um, then that can create a friction point. Um, for, for indirect, and honestly, for the vast majority of procurement transactions that we see, especially uh, the bigger the company is, um, suppliers are, are typically willing to um, you know, adopt a way um, even if it's a little bit of friction, it, they know it will ultimately make their life easier in the long run to have a centralized repository and system of record with that customer so that they can see the history of the relationship uh, as, as well. I think the, the last thing I'll just mention in this, uh, it, it factored into how we thought about it when we, we were designing it for, for Orchestro, is that we're seeing the rise of embedded platforms and so if you think about it, you know, Orchestro in most companies lives inside of Coupa or Ariva or Zykus or another platform that they've already done the supplier adoption for. And uh, what we've essentially done is created orchestration layers across multiple systems on the procurement side and then really enabled a very seamless all in email approach to interact with those systems for suppliers that look and feel like the you know, emails that they're already receiving from the system. And so I think when you get down into the nitty gritty, you're gonna see more of this concept of embedded platforms, orchestration. If you look at the massive growth um, in the you know, golden record supplier data side of the table with people like Tealbook or Graphite Systems, that's a, that's a theme that we're seeing there uh, as well. Yeah, fair point. A really good point, though, because the next question said, can you again define predictive procurement orchestration? And you've just mentioned that. So can you define what that phrase, predictive procurement orchestration, means? Well, yeah. So I think, you know, just to go backwards <laughs> for a second, the orchestration is, uh, 
you know, orchestrating data and processes across multiple systems, often systems that don't necessarily talk to each other today, mm -hmm. or where there's not uh, synchronous data flow uh, across those systems. So that's orchestration. Uh, you're seeing orchestration in many categories of technology where there's been lots of different solutions over the years. And so any company that has multiple ERPs, potentially multiple systems in different business units, uh, you're going to see the growth of orchestration layers. And yeah, you see that actually in sales and marketing technology as well. There's now revenue orchestration, market uh, account-based marketing orchestration. And so procurement is going to get its own flavor of orchestration just because people are sick of porting data manually from one system to another. <laughs> and that's, that's just a, a persistent pain point. Um, when you go uh, to the to the front of it with predictive procurement orchestration, what does predictive mean? Uh, again, it goes back to this idea of um, just very simply procurement getting involved earlier creates value. It creates intrinsic value. And so uh, sometimes people say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of remedy. Well, that can be measured in terms of a financial impact to the business when it comes to procurement. If you can get a sense of what your stakeholders want before they ask you, if you can get a sense of what your suppliers are going to quote before they give you an offer, that can provide uh, massive outsized value. And so when you put it all together, what Orchestro does for predictive procurement orchestration is we simulate procurement activities before they begin. We propose outcomes often to multiple parties simultaneously, and then we enable procurement's best decisions from uh, the best people already in, in role at your team to get recommended to other people, often through email uh, or embedded within systems you're already using. Coupa and Ariba are probably the two systems that we embed in the most, uh, but there are a host of other systems, including Power BI and, uh, of course, ERP systems like SAP uh, and Oracle. Good. So one person made a comment to share and it said large versus small procurement teams really is based on the competency of the staff and the technology tools at hand. So do you agree with that? Is it really based on competency and tools? You can have a highly competent, but no funding for tools, maybe less effective and vice versa. I, I, yeah. I think that it, I think it plays into a, part of what I was thinking earlier when we were answering that question is what is the, what's the historical investment into that procurement organization? Mm -hmm. um, you could have a large organization that doesn't get any investment mm -hmm. <laughs> at yes. times too. Um, an investment could be in their people. It could be in technologies. It could be in process improvements, whatever that might be. So I, I can definitely see that that's a factor, but you can have the best people, the best tools, but if they're still not focused in the right areas, if they don't have time to go deep on certain categories as need be, I, I I think you get you don't you get a subpar um, result at the end of the day, and that can happen in a small team or a large team. Absolutely. Yeah. So another question said, "Do you see trends involving temp layer and full time employees? Yes. So they are hiring freezes, but staff augmenting with contractors. Is that what we're doing right now? So where are you seeing the trends?" Yeah, so I actually, um, I did some research on this personally a couple of weeks ago because what I was hearing and well, I'll give you an example. So I was at our Kestro's Optimal a couple of months ago and we were there, we were um, a sponsor and um, we were there to meet prospects, current clients, et cetera. The number one lead that we got were people looking for independent contractor work, like six people. And we've we've hired several of them <laughs> along the way. So um, so it's just been it's been an interesting shift in conversation where a lot of people that we're talking to right now, um, they have had very successful procurement careers and they don't have a desire to go back to corporate. Um, mm -hmm. So we're seeing quite a few people going out as independent contractors. Um, we have seen a steady increase of work ourselves as contractors and, and consultants to larger organizations that they don't have process improvement or COE type people in their organizations, change management leads. So we're seeing an uptick in our own business because of the, the, the shift from, hey, we can't hire a headcount, but we do, we can hire a consultant or a contractor for this spe the specific need that we have. 
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I would I would add on to that and just to say that if you look at the research that's been done around um, incentives in the workforce, the number one non-financial incentive that people want is flexibility. And that's that's across the board. And so if you think about uh, like what Amanda was saying with these talented procurement folks who might have 20, 30 years experience, but don't make them sit in a long meeting that's not going to create impact just you know just because <laughs> like people are over yep. that they're they're like there is you get to a certain point and you say i've put i've put in my time in like you know sitting in those meetings and and offering that where you know you get um they're like hey let me be let me be dangerous let me give me some numbers and tell me which way you want them to move and you know i'll figure it out and do it but I don't want to put up with the kind of building consensus and kind of the, the process around that. And I think that you're seeing a class of people that are available on the, on the job market for independent contractors that just authentically have a better value proposition, regardless of whether they're temporary or permanent. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. So what about a trend? Are you seeing much outsourcing of procurement teams? I am not hearing that as often. I am really not. Um, now components of like, for instance, um, there are things what I what I would consider white space around procurement. So like having an analytics person in house, that might not be the case. Like they might that that might bring in a third party for that. But holistically, I'm not seeing outsourcing of the entire procurement organization. I don't, Edmund, are you seeing anything different? Yeah, I, I'd echo that. We were actually just having a uh, discussion with, with some, uh, some people that are in our ecosystem about BPO just generally as a topic. And, uh, you know, I think the ability, especially to have a modular shared services capability that is outsourced, you know, that uh, especially if you can have a few folks that can work roughly on your time zone in a different area of the world. The cost advantages of that are high for shared services type work. And then that frees up the strategic procurement professionals on your team to really focus on um, category strategy and uh, executing on uh, strategic projects. So I, I think you are seeing some outsourcing Again, but to Amanda's point, um, in in specific targeted areas. So. Yeah. So, how would you handle then the situation that we typically outsource the transactional for you know type of work that, that is done in procurement, the work that that smart people don't want to do? But as we automate more and more of that, are the outsourced teams going to need to learn new skill sets in order to be able to still add value? Because we don't need a bunch mm -hmm. of people sitting and doing number crunching if we've automated a lot of that work. And so mm -hmm. is that a skill set that, and, you know, we have the largest population growth is taking place in India. It's beating yeah. even China and definitely the United States. So at some point we're going to need that workforce, but are they learning the right skills in order to be able to ha handle the higher strategic value that's going to be required of them in the future? So I'll just give a personal experience here. So one of my last uh, stays in corporate, we had an outsourcing deal with our accounts payable organization. So it wasn't um, transactional procurement, but it was AP. And it was through that outsourced partner that I learned of RPA, right? So they were, they were on the front end of it um, uh -huh. and teaching us what it was and bringing that capability into their organization. So I think if you have a good strategic partner that you're working with in your BPO, they 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 should be bringing you the latest and greatest technologies and bringing that capability. I think that should be an expectation that we have of our BPO providers. Good point. Okay. Yeah. So we have two minutes. So Edmund, do you have a <laughs> final question that you would like to position with Amanda? Because... Um, and, and thank you for answering all the questions that were in the queue. But I'm going to hand it back to you to wrap it up because we only asked for an hour of time. So take it away. Yeah, I think maybe, Amanda, we can each make just a closing statement and, and uh, send people on their way. So um, 
you know, I'll just say it's been a real pleasure getting to have this conversation. It's always fun to to hear um, from the community, from the SIG community, and of course, Amanda, to to hear from you and 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 talk to you. I'll just say that regardless of whether or not a uh, recession is coming or imminent, there's an old uh, expression, which is never let a good crisis go to waste. And I would say that it's a challenge uh, that's thrown to us as procurement professionals to say, what can we do to increase the impact, relevance, and value of the work that we do to the business stakeholders, whether you're at the CPO level, whether you're at the manager level, wherever you're at in the organization on your procurement journey in your career, there are opportunities that 2023 has for you. Um, and just because you might be personally feeling economically anxious, that doesn't mean that your work hasn't become more valuable. So I Amanda, would, to, to you. I, yes, absolutely. And, and thank you for inviting me to have this conversation with you today, Don. It's always a pleasure to see you too. And um, I will just say, just to keep it short and brief, now is the time to shine for procurement, right? It is an absolutely amazing time to show off our talents and bring value, differentiate value to the organization and in the marketplace. So uh, conversations like these help us all do that. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, we got everyone's attention with the crisis and the pandemic and all the supply chain woes. So now that they've, we've got attention, everyone's looking at us. So it is time to... Yeah sure that we keep carrying that forward and shining. So just to share, um, thanks, Edmund, Amanda, and Dawn, insightful topics, great conversation, very informative, great insight. I, I'm looking forward to reviewing the tape session and sharing it with my management to great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up on a big thank you to the two of you and to our Kestro for bringing this to us and to our SIG community. And thank you to all of you that participated and shared your thoughts and your feelings. I really appreciate each and every one of you. So everyone go forth, have a wonderful day, evening, wherever you are, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you in our Power Hour um, webinar very, very soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you.